Hi right, friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. Today we continue our coverage of the third year of the Clone Wars, but before we begin that episode, hit that subscribe and notification button down below. In our last episode in the series, we took a look at the extremely deadly Battle of Umbara. Today we'll be looking at the very controversial subject of slavery and how the Republic dealt with it, especially in the border regions of the Outer Rim. Chapter 8 slavery in the Republic. The founding document of the Republic, the Galactic Constitution, states through the Right of Sentience Clause that all sentient beings are created equal. It outlawed slavery and forced servitude and guaranteed protection against such hardships. Legends say that the Galactic Constitution was written almost 25,000 years ago. At the time, it was said that the Right of Sentience Clause was considered very radical. This is because there are many pro-slavery territories and planets within the galaxy. And like any edict or law that's passed by the central government, enforcement was always an issue, especially in areas where you didn't have a lot of influence. There were plenty of slave empires and other territories that traded in slavery, especially in the outer rim of the galaxy. Hut space, for most of its existence, managed to live with amiable diplomatic relations with the Republic, despite having a thriving slave trade. Anakin Skywalker, who grew up as a slave on Tatooine, fondly remembers having an explosive chip in his head that would go off if he tried to run away from his master. Even more worrying were the feline Zygarians, who had built a massive empire in the Outer Rim based on their slaving enterprises. They had refined the enslaving of sentient beings into a fine art and were sort of like the Kaminoans of forced labor. The Jedi Order would eventually launch a campaign against the Zygerian Empire and take out their monarch, freeing most of the slaves there. Most of the Zygerian slavers that were left went underground. During times of peace in the Republic, the Galactic Senate and Judicial Forces had the resources and time to sanction and prevent slavery operations within Republic space. But as the Clone Wars broke out all across the galaxy, resources had to be shifted to fight against the Separatist Alliance. Although the Confederacy of Independent Systems had similar founding principles as the Galactic Republic, there had been rumors that the Separatist Alliance had been employing slavers and had been using slaves for forced labor. In the third year of the Clone Wars, during the Battle of Mon Calamari, the Separatists forced the Corn Isolation Link to enslave their Mon Calamari neighbors and put them into work camps. And now there were rumors in the outer rim of the re-emergence of the Zygerian slave traders and their long dormant empire. Kuros was a beautiful planet, full of green valleys and cascading waterfalls. Located in the expansion region of the galaxy, it was completely unspoiled and undeveloped. The only people living on the surface of this world were a group of peaceful Togrutans who established a pacifist artisan colony. The only resources that are worth taking on this planet were the sentient beings living there. Facing an imminent Separatist invasion, the Togrutan governor goes against the Republic's advice and decides to try to negotiate with Count Dooku and sue for peace. The droid army arrives shortly after, and Dooku is accompanied by a Zygerian noble. Dooku offers the Togrutan safe passage, aka enslavement, and soon all the people in the colony are peacefully rounded up. Despite realizing that the Republic would arrive too late to really save these people, Yoda still sent Anakin Skywalker, Obi-Wan Kenobi, and Ahsoka Tano to check out the situation. They arrive 10 days after the Separatist invasion and find no sign of the colonists. Dooku had left a small force behind to hold the colony. They are commanded by the Zygerian officer who we saw earlier. And as the Republic troops move into the colony, his commando droids ambush them and soon the clones are engaged in speeder-to-speeder -speeder combat. The Republic forces make quick work of the Separatist droids and quickly secure what's left of the colony. At which point the Zygerian officer calls for a ceasefire and negotiation. Anakin, recognizing his species, immediately wants to handle the situation because of his history with slavery. Obi-Wan Kenobi decides it's better that he go and speak with the Separatist commander. Unfortunately, the Zagarians hate the Jedi almost as much as Anakin hates them and have laid a trap for the Republic forces. They purposely let the Republic march into the colony because they planted bombs in all the buildings around them. The showy series, he sets off one of the explosives, wounding several clones. He demands that Obi-Wan Kenobi surrender, and the Jedi has no choice but to comply. But before he's taken away, Obi-Wan Kenobi decides to challenge the Zygarian officer to a one-on-one -on -one martial contest. This is a deeply rooted part of Zygarian culture, and he knows that the Zygarian officer cannot resist the opportunity to beat him up. If Obi-Wan Kenobi wins this contest, he gets the location of the slaves, along with the location of all of the bombs. 
The slaver had promised Count Dooku not to kill the Jedi, but he couldn't pass on a chance to pummel his hated enemy, and so the two quickly started fighting each other. Although Obi-Wan Kenobi doesn't have his lightsaber, he still is a Jedi and could use his special abilities to gain the upper hand. But he lets Zygarian think he has the upper hand so that he can extend the fight as long as possible in order to give Anakin and Ahsoka more time on their own mission. The two Jedi had become ad hoc EOD specialists and were running around the colony looking for the bombs. Their technique for defusing bombs is pretty suspect and would even make Hawkeye and Hurt Locker nervous. Somehow, they managed to defuse all the bombs, which leaves the Zygarian without a bargaining chip. Before the slaver can run away and escape, though, Anakin is stuck aboard a ship and take it over, forcing him to reveal his plans. You see, the Zygarian Queen was holding a royal slavery auction, and it would attract buyers from all around the galaxy. This was a very blatant uh, sign that the Zygarian Empire was once again comfortable enough to trade slaves out in the open. This information is relayed to the Jedi Council. Yoda is worried about the return of slavery to the galaxy. It was a powerful tool for the Sith back when they were in power. And so Anakin, Obi-Wan, and Ahsoka are sent straight into the heart of the re-emerging slave empire to the planet of Zygeria. Zygeria is located in the Outer Rim, deep in Separatist territory, only a few jumps away from the capital of the entire confederacy, Raxus. The Clone Wars has clearly benefited the world. As the Jedi arrive in their stolen Zygerian slaver ship, they find themselves caught in a heavy line of traffic waiting to enter the planet. Business is good. Their main goal is to find out where exactly all the Kuros colonists are being kept. While Obi-Wan, Anakin, and Rex act as slavers, Ahsoka Tano dresses like a slave. Anakin's plan is to try and charm the Queen and get into her good graces so that they can find out what exactly is going on. Anakin uses his knowledge of Bruno Denturi, the Zygarian commander he had faced on Kuros, to get in an audience with her. Bruno apparently was a hated enemy of the Queen, and Anakin lets her know that he no longer was a problem. He had personally handled the issue. To make the plot even sweeter, Anakin also gives Ahsoka to the Queen, claiming she was one of Bruno's former slaves. The ruse works well, and quickly Anakin becomes a confidant of the monarch, especially after he saves her from one of her own slaves who tries to kill her. Meanwhile, Obi-Wan and Rex visit the slave pits and manage to find Governor Rusty, the leader of the Kira's colony. Unfortunately, the old Sigrun is too weak and broken to be of any help. Obi-Wan and Rex decide to try and rescue him, but on their way out of the slave pits, the Governor and Kenobi are shot and captured. The Tigrutan is immediately auctioned off to the highest bidder during the auction. He represents the 50,000 Tigrutan colonists that are being held by the Zygarians. Anakin tries to ask the Queen where she was keeping so many slaves at one time, but before she can answer, Obi-Wan Kenobi is paraded out into the arena as well. His capture is a great victory for the Zygarians. The Queen asks Anakin to torture Obi-Wan in front of the crowd for entertainment in order to prove his loyalty. Anakin has to blow his cover and gives a signal to R2-D2 to launch the two Jedi's lightsabers to them, and Obi-Wan and Anakin attempt to break out. Captain Rex and Ahsoka try to help them as well, but ultimately there are too many Zygerians there for them to overcome. And their energy whips are a good counter against the Jedi's lightsabers, and the Republic team is quickly recaptured one by one. Ahsoka is hung in a cage like a bird, Anakin becomes the Queen's personal slave and bodyguard, and Obi-Wan Kenobi and Captain Rex are sent to the Zygerian Slave Processing Center on Kadavo in Wild Space, which is where they finally find the location of the rest of the Tigurtans. Kadavo is a pretty messed up place, perfectly designed to break sentient beings and turn them into slaves both physically and mentally. The warden of the facility has particular interest in breaking the Jedi. Although he's never broken a Jedi, he immediately finds out Obi-Wan's weakness. While he can handle torture and physical labor, what Obi-Wan can't stand is seeing other people around him get hurt. And soon, Obi-Wan realizes that whenever he disobeys the slavers or tries to resist, another slave near him will be punished or even killed. Obi-Wan begins to lose hope, as the only thing he can do now is just sit and watch people around him suffer. It's a skill that Obi-Wan Kenobi will use once again when he goes into exile on Tatooine, where he'll wait for decades watching Luke Skywalker. During his exile, he witnessed many innocents being preyed on by Jabba's gangs, but he was unable to do anything because he was afraid of drawing too much attention. Meanwhile, Count Dooku finally arrives on Zygeria. He's officially sent by Emperor Palpatine to strengthen the ties between the Sith and the Slave Empire. In reality, Palpatine and Dooku want the Zygerians to stop trying to enslave Jedi. It's very likely the Sith are troubled by the Zygerians' ability to control Force sensitives. The Queen, however, refuses to listen to Dooku and is immediately Force choked. Her Prime Minister then betrays her and agrees to take her place and follow the Sith's plan, which is, of course, to kill all of the Jedi. 
Anakin comes out of nowhere, though, in the last moment and attempts to extract the queen from the room. He manages to grab her, and Ahsoka Tano, who is also broken free of her cage, is waiting with their ship. Before the queen dies in Anakin's arms, she tells her where Obi-Wan Kenobi is being held. Anakin and Ahsoka head to Kadavo and quickly launch an assault against the slavers. They also call in some reinforcements in the form of a Republic cruiser and fighter squadron wolf pack led by Plo Koon. The slavers don't really stand much of a chance against their aerial assault. The only bargaining chip the warden now has is all of his slaves, which he threatens to kill if the Republic don't halt their attack. Obi-Wan and Rex break free inside the compound while Anakin breaches the front door with Ahsoka. With the aerial defenses now down, Republic dropships arrive with more ground reinforcements. Seeing that all is lost, the Warden tries to plunge all of the remaining Tigritan slaves into the chasm below the facility. Before they all plummet to their deaths, the captain of the Republic cruiser manages to park itself below the facility and clones using jetpacks and cables help rescue them just in time. It's a small victory for the Republic, but only the beginning for slavery's return to the galaxy. When the Empire rises only a year later, the right of sentience is replaced by what's known as high human culture. So as you can see, massive warfare causes a lot of instability, which leads to uh, nefarious activities like slave trading. This is just one of the side effects of this war, which has now gone on for three years. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below. And as usual, thanks for joining us today. If you're watching this, you are Generation Tech.